Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Testing. Wonderful. Good morning, fancy meat computers. How is everybody today? I see we've got a whole 17 people watching. Fantastic. Of course, this, uh, this doesn't count the people who may be watching over the big screen. So there we go. Thank you. Excellent. I can confirm. Yes, actually, it's... Uh, it's kind of cool, the uh, the streaming software here. I have actually like a live feed of the stream running in the, you know, and I can actually unmute it and check for myself to see whether I'm or whether or not I'm audible um, and what the quality of the audio is. So that's quite cool. <laughs> Good. So, um, I guess we've got a midterm tomorrow. So, I, I've asked, I, I've, I've answered various questions about the midterm, um, in previous classes. But uh, if anybody has any questions about the midterm, please take the opportunity now. So, is this the part where you spill the beans on the midterm? Uh, well, um. You might get a couple of beans. We'll see. Uh, I'm not going to spill all the beans, but uh, there might be the occasional bean slippage. You know. I need a question, though. I can't work with nothing. How do you th difficult do you think the midterm is for us? Um, how many questions are there? Are, is it as hard as the assignment? Oh, here they come. All right, I'll have to do these in order. How difficult do you, would you think the midterm is for us? Strongly depends. Um, not generally reliable. Like there's such a, there's no, there's like, The goal with all of my tests is that a student who is meeting expectations should get a 70 to 80 uh, percent on the test. Um, it's a programming test, so you're going to have to be good at programming. Uh, a lot of the sort of meta skills that will go into your success in the program is being able to figure out your own syntax errors and figure out your own seg faults and, you know, just generally be able to fix your programs quickly. Uh, in terms of question difficulty, I'd like to think that they are sort of in the vicinity of assignment problems, perhaps on the easier side of the assignment problems, uh, given that, you know, you only have an hour, an hour and a half to complete it. So there you go. How many questions are there? I am not at liberty to, to disclose. If on the test there is a math ask code question, we will be provided with the equation and all we need, correct? Oh yes, absolutely. I wouldn't, like, unless it was something like stupidly basic, like Pythagorean theorem, right? Basically, you know, all of the common formulas that you learned, like, through elementary and high school, like, that's 
assumed knowledge at this point. So that stuff, that type of stuff is fair game. But, you know, certainly, I will put it to you this way. Each question contains a full description of the problem sufficient for uh, writing the problem out in the absence of any other information. Aside from knowledge of how to program itself. Um, may I please clarify exactly what content will be covered? Uh, yes, um, I will clarify that for sure. Right here. So this... Uh, this right here is the last slide covered up to the midterm. Functions and uh, dynamic allocation will not be on the midterm. Everything before that is fair game. Anything special we should be sure to put on our crib sheet. Your name and student number. People often forget that. What do I recommend you include on the cheat sheet in terms of what type of info to include? Um, well, syntax of basic C, uh, you know, C syntax is a good one. Um, descriptions of how to fix various errors and like, like if you, if you, uh, you know, like a little uh, quick reference for like, if I get this kind of error, this is probably the problem. That would probably be a good thing to put on there. Um, yeah, the cheat sheet is up to you, though. It's your study tool. It's your study tool. Um, think of it as much as being part of the studying process as, uh, you know, a memory aid, memory aid during the test. Uh, in particular, please don't share cheat sheet. Like, don't just use someone else's cheat sheet cheat sheet it completely defeats the purpose will comments be necessary for marks and if so how in detail comments will not be necessary for marks basically the thing is getting marked in the exact same ma uh the exact same way as the assignments so i think my my, my lens is a little smudgy give me a second here It looks like le lens smudge. Doesn't it look like lens smudge? Eh, anyway. When it comes to the gra to grading the test, if uh, a... Ugh. I think what you meant to say is if a program doesn't run, there's no such thing as a code, you encode into a code, but what you are writing is programs. When it comes to grading the test, if a program doesn't run, is that an automatic zero, or will there be there be some sort of part mark system? Uh, nope, you, uh, again, if you submit something with syntax errors, it's worth nothing. Um, you have to be able to pass at least a couple of test cases to get any marks whatsoever. Um, yeah, if you just, like, you know, if you write me an essay instead of a C problem, uh, instead of a, a C program, you don't get any marks. Um, yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no part marks for, um, you know, half finished solutions. Will our crib sheets be collected after the test? No, you're welcome to keep them. It's double sided, right? Yes. Uh, well, we need to know basic bash commands, since not everyone will be using bash to run slash compile their code. Um, you're free to use whatever C development system you've been using so far. However, submission still must be made using git, uh, your standard git repository. Can I, can I clarify double pointers, please, and will it be on the test? Um, perhaps a bit later. Um that's asking me to go over content. Right now I'm on the sort of structural things. Am I going to be providing the necessary header files and prototypes a la the assignments? Yes, I will be providing the uh, 
function prototypes and um, you, you guys know that like if you want to use header files other than the ones provided then you, that you're welcome to right yeah but um, will we be given tests for the code and the answer to the test code for them unless it's something like mean median etc yes um, you will be given some code to test your uh, to test your functions but uh, of course if you want to test further than the given test code, then that's up to you. Will you get scrap paper besides the crib sheet if you want to verify uh, your program's answers beyond the given test cases? Um, I mean, yeah, uh, scrap paper is... Uh, yeah, we can provide scrap paper. I missed the part about the crib... If you missed a part of this, then just rewind it. It's a live stream. Can you bring a calculator? Yes, you may have your McMaster standard calculator. Y yes, McMaster standard calculator. Good. Um, can I go over double pointers? I can in brief. So, <sighs> this is how double pointers work, right? So you've got an integer right? You've got an integer po uh, integer pointer, right? Uh, address of x, or I need to call it something else, x pointer. And then we have double pointer x d pointer gets the address of Point, x pointer so this is really this is like your basic setup for a um, double pointer system right so literally it's just the same operation but applied to um, a pointer rather than to a variable directly so if I were to visualize using my favorite Linux Paint program. So, if we imagine this white page is uh, memory, I have a cell in memory, which is named X, which has some value say five, right? Elsewhere in memory, I have x pointer, right? Which is an arrow or a pointer to x. Then I might have another cell in memory, x d pointer, which is a pointer to this guy, right? It's just a pointer to a pointer. <clears throat> so, you know, with these types of problems, I cannot stress enough that... Um, Drawing out the problem is extremely helpful for understanding it. Like, draw the data structure, draw the pointers. That will help you program quite a lot. Would the same code work if you did not include the ampersand before x, for example, on line 3? Nope, the ampersand is absolutely required. The ampersand, remember, is the address of operator. It returns the memory address of whatever uh, is after it, right? So in the case of, the fir uh, of uh, line 3 here, this returns the address, of, um, the address of the integer x, which I should say is equal to 5, right? So if this ampersand weren't here, then x pointer would be assigned 5, the raw number 5, 
which means that if you tried dereferencing it, you would get a segmentation fault. Uh, the same thing here. If this ampersand were not here, uh, basically we would not be producing a pointer to x pointer. We would be producing a pointer to the same thing that x pointer is pointing to, right? We would duplicate the reference rather than getting a reference to the reference. Make sense? Then the pointer would just be the value of x, which doesn't have a value yet. Um, well, it does now, but... Uh, no, the pointer is not the value of x. Yeah. Oh, wait. No, you're answering the previous question. Yeah. If that were the case... Yeah. If we left off the ampersand, then that would just be the value of x. Is it true that we can create a new single pointer that points to the double pointer? Yes. Um, except it wouldn't be... Like, single pointers, like, they're all just pointers. The question is how many how many pointers do you have to go through to get to a value that's not a pointer? So if you wanted to add another pointer, right? So, you know, int star pointer 2, right? Um insert is equal to, you know, the address of x. Like if you did that, right, x pointer did that, that's a pointer to a pointer to a pointer. Um, so there you go. We, we might call this x triple pointer. You can just go as far as you want. Sometimes I get errors for using star instead of ampersand and vice versa, even though they are inverse operations. Um, 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 just because they're inverse operations does not mean that you can use them interchangeably. One undoes the other, but they have very different meanings. You can't just use one or the other. Um... Could you, can I explain all the main errors we could get in the code and how to solve for them? I mean, not in a lecture. Like, that's kind of been, like, the process of this course so far, right? Um, can I please clarify what the difference is between star and ampersand in terms of when and how they should be used? No, I can, uh, because when and how they should be used, you need to use your intelligence to find out that's what we're testing. I can tell you what they do. That's what I can do. All right. So ampersand takes a value in memory, right? It returns the address of that value in memory as an as a number, right? It find it returns the memory address of the value specif of the of the cell in memory specified, right? The star star x for example dereferences. So a memory address goes in, and an operation on the memory cell comes out. So it's either reading or writing. If it's to the left of the equal sign, then you are following the reference and assigning to the memory cell specified. If it's on the right side of the equal sign, then you are following the, you are following, you're looking up that memory address and reading the contents rather than writing. So there you go. If you are pointing to an array, do you need the ampersand before the array name? Um, example, a pointer to array blah. So you need to say int pointer. Um, so no, not generally, uh, to Brandon's question. If you have a, um, if you have like int foo, right, is some array. If you want to reference that array, there are a couple of ways of doing it, right? Um, so int star 
pointer can be equal to either foo. That's one alternative. You can also say, if you want to be more precise, the address of foo at zero, um, which is a little bit redundant. If you want to take the address of some element of the array, you just modify the index here. Um, how much math will be involved in functions we have to write for the test? Uh, all of programming is math, so a lot. If you're asking how much direct formula translation there will be on the test, uh, it's going to be more algorithms-y than, uh, than, you know, the assignment one material, shall we say. Um, sort of classic programming problem type stuff. What algorithms should we know going in? All of the ones we've covered in class. Um, if you're asking me what algorithms should we know going in, you're basically asking me what are the test problems, and I'm not going to tell you what the test problems are before the test. You'll just have to wait and see. So there you go. Um, you may have noticed this, but my courses are not focused on the mere regurgitation of information presented in lecture when I can help it. You are actually going to have to think about a problem that you've never seen before. Uh, would it be advisable to memorize the algorithms we've learned so far? No. Um, it is mu a much better use of your time to practice programming problems rather than memorizing things out of the uh, out of the slides. We're going to do the lecture now. Will we have to understand void pointers? Again, that is testable. I'm not going to reveal whether or not it is on the test. Okay? We cool? <clears throat> right. So, we were talking about conversion functions. We had talked about converting strings to doubles. We cool? Okay, good. Thank you, Joseph. So let's talk about converting strings to integers. Similarly to str2d, the standard library provides a function for converting strings to integers. str2l. Uh, you might think there should be an i here. In fact, it's l for long, long int. Um, you might be saying, why are we doing long ints instead of regular ints? And there are like complicated backstory reasons, basically. You'll notice that uh, the interface here is almost precisely what it is for string 2D. The only difference is int base. Um, base accepts which base you're interpreting the number as. So if you, uh, you know, if you select 10, that's by default, right? Uh, because that's decimal. If you select 16, that's hexadecimal. If you select 8, that's octal, etc., etc. Uh, otherwise, things work pretty much exactly the same way as str2d. There are a number of conversion functions that work in a similar manner. So we've got d, f, and l for double, float, and long int. ul is unsigned long int. ll, excuse me, long, long int, ull, unsigned long, long int. So note the absence of functions to convert integers and short integers. This is possible uh, directly due to the unsafe a2i function. a2i is unnecessary as str2l can be easily typecast as either int or short. So I would like everybody to please pay attention because this is a portion, this is a portion of the class where I tell you that the internet is wrong. All right. Those of you who have been using the internet as your primary reference for this class so far, 
will be told by the internet to use a to i in order to convert strings to integers. It is an unsafe function. Do not use it. Use str2l and then typecast. If I see anybody using a to i, then you don't get any you don't get any help to from me until you fix it and you will have uh, lowered yourself considerably in my uh, in my view um, and expectations because it means that you're not even paying attention to what I'm saying you're just thinking that oh I can just go off on the internet and you know the internet will tell me everything I need to know I why do I even need a prof you know sort of thing so don't use a2i even the even though the internet says you can you can't it's not safe we're getting there so here we go all right so to understand why there's uh, so it wouldn't be an issue right um uh, it, it wouldn't be an issue if there was a string to i function, right? But in order to understand why there's no string to i function, we need the historical context. So here we go, all right? So, when C was created in 1972, it was created for 16-bit architectures. The original size of an integer was also 16 bits. Shortly thereafter, just within a couple of years, 32-bit file systems became popular. So you have to imagine this, right? The processor architecture is still running 16 bits, but the file system architecture is now on 32 bits. So you have a difference between the file system architecture and the processor architecture. At first, programmers used integer arrays of two elements to bridge the processor file system gap, but this was not the best solution for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, basically, it turns any array, it turns all integers into arrays of integers, right? This was the initial solution to this problem. The long data type was added as a native data type to C, despite needing multiple 16-bit CPU operations to simulate 32-bit arithmetic. So rather than have C programmers create these arrays of two integers, they added long, despite the fact that long is actually longer than the CPU bit width, right? Programmers realized they could increase resource efficiency by using int where they could get away with it, and long only if they really needed the extra space. This prompted the addition of a short, uh, short integer, originally and still defined as 16 bits. So int was therefore freed up to mean something convenient for performance. So long was defined as, you know, tied to the uh, file system originally. Short, so originally longs were 32, shorts were 16, and int was whatever was convenient, right? Um, something with good performance. Basically, the most you can... Basically, that comes out to the word size of the processor architecture. Even by 1976, the code base of C programs had become so large that changing the definitions of short, int, and long was considered highly irresponsible. Under 32-bit architectures, int and long uh, are the same size. So int and long are both still 32 bits. Under 64-bit architectures, long was increased to 64 bits, but int remained at 32 bits. This is why ints in C are 4 bits and longs are 8 bits. In practice, int values rarely exceed 32 bits, so memory consideration became uh, memory considerations became the performance bottleneck. In short, for str2l, long int did the job and easily cast is easily castable to int. So nobody thought that str2i was necessary. So that's why it doesn't exist, right? So.
in order to understand why AT, A2I is not correct, to answer your question, why is it unsafe, um, it doesn't work for numbers with more than nine digits. Um, according to this person, it might vary by your architecture. Right? Answer, don't use A2I or any of these functions. Um, there's the, your explanation, all right, for why. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but um, there you go. They are not, um, where, where is it here? <laughs> yeah, basically A2I is uh, deprecated. It's one of the very, very few instances where C has a function that has been deprecated. So don't use it, all right? It still exists in the standard library because C must maintain back compatibility to very old programs before better alternatives existed. But um, basically, they couldn't patch the problems away. They had to write a new function. So don't use A2I. It's deprecated. It doesn't work all the time. It's not safe. Take my word for it. So... So we've talked about converting strings to numbers. Let's talk about converting numbers to strings. We know how to read numeric values from strings. The question remains, how do we write numeric values into strings? So sort of similar to the goTo function as well. Yes, uh, and goTo's aren't a function. They are a uh, primary language construct on the same level as if statements or while loops. It's it. It's yeah. It's it's an archaic function that has lost its functionality. If you use it, you will most likely be introducing errors, so don't use it. And, like, I believe the top hit on Google for how to convert from string to integer in C does... Actually, we can check that right now. Let's see here. Google C convert string to int. Yeah, there you go. Top hit on Google tells you to use A2I. Madness. Absolute madness. This is why you shouldn't uncritically trust everything that Google tells you. This is why educational institutions still have a place in the modern era, because the internet can and often is wrong, despite the fact that I'm now conveying this information to you over the internet itself. We'll sort of ignore that. Google doesn't know everything. So... It is not the sum total of all human knowledge. It is the commonality of all human ignorance. Thank you. So, maybe that's being a bit harsh, but anyway. So, trick question. Converting, like, converting integers to strings is something we've been doing all along. Every single time we've used printf, we have done this. So here, uh, it turns out that printf is actually one in a uh, one in a series. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Uh, printf is actually one of a family of functions, which all do similar things. We're going to sort of see a lot of this in this uh, series of lectures. Um, f printf is printf for files. Sn printf is printf for strings of size limited quality. So the n means up to n, and s means you're printing to strings instead of just printing to standard output, right? So str string is a pointer to the memory address where the characters will be written to. Uh, normally you call it like buffer and just give it like, you know, 
50, 100 characters or something. Size sets the maximum number of characters to write. Re uh, remember to leave enough space both in both of the above for null termination. So S SN printf is a safe printf func uh, it's a safe string conversion function that will not exceed the size of the string that you're putting in so long as the string size of that string is correctly specified. This is in contrast to S printf, the unsafe version, which again, I'm sure if you Google it, um, if you Google something like, uh, you know, convert int to string C. Let's see what they, let's see what, um, yeah, there you go. Geeks for Geeks says the S printf function. Again, not safe. Um, the problem with using S printf rather than using SN printf, again, is S printf uh, lacks the size, uh, the size um, parameter. It's not, it's not safely restricted as to how many value, how much, um, how much memory it can write to. So, with S printf, it is 100% pos possible to write more characters into your string than act than there is space allocated, which of course might cause a stack smashing attack detection. That might cause seg fault. It's you know memory memory problems aplenty, right? S N printf. You specify the size. The function literally cannot exceed it, right? Um, although it will blow out the null character if, po if, if you don't leave enough space for it. And it cannot possibly cause a stack smashing attack so long as this has been correctly used. So this is the safe version. Unlike, like... I don't know what it is about like C programming and Google, but like all almost like like a lot of their suggestions are not good programming practice, and I'm not sure why. It's probably because people learn these these uh, they learn these things from manuals, and uh, you know, frankly, also you're in an engineering program. Safety is a concern of engineers, whereas safety is not so much a concern of like you know people in college or computer science programs right they don't care as much about safety the whole point of you guys being engineer is engineers is that this the systems that you design should work right and should work reliably which means using the more reliable variants of all of the functions that people you know it's not that much extra work to specify the size that's what i'm saying i guess anyway Every other every argument past the second is used in precisely the same format as printf. So past these first two arguments, you are literally just using it exactly the same as printf, and hopefully everybody knows how to do that by now. What error would result if we knock out the null character by converting it too long of a string? If you try to print it, you'll probably seg fault, or not seg fault, but you know, you'll get garbage at the end, because probably there'll be a zero between the end of your string and uh, the end of the stack frame. Um, there, there exists the possibility of a seg fault. Certainly there would be the introduction of garbage data. All of those uh, lovely C functions uh, that we're about to cover, which require null termination to detect their end condition, would overshoot the end. So... The return value of SN printf is the size of the format string after substitution. Note that this may be distinct from the size of the string written into memory, uh, and likely is. This might mean, uh, uh, this means that we can check to see if the string had to be truncated by comparing the input size to the output size. So, if we have a buffer of some particular size, right, um, if if j which is the so 
the return value is the number, uh, like it's, it's the size of the string after the substitution of the numbers in, right? But before that string is plunked into memory. So if you've lost characters between the substitution step and the writing, writing it into your character array step, then you'll be able to detect truncation. Kill. So, let's talk about strings. I, I get it. He's, uh, he was asked to write uh, 500 times on the board. I will not throw paper airplanes in class. So he wrote a C program that writes one, uh, 500 times on the board. I will not throw air paper airplanes in class. Right? It's funny. <clears throat> so. We're going to have like a, a rapid fire round of st basic string operations right? Most of these will operate on like the same kind of an idea or the same kind of a basis. Once we've learned the first one, the rest should come easier. But these are, these are the types of operations that are like b baked into operators and things like Python. So have you ever wanted to copy a string? String copy and string n copy are the functions for you. String n copy being the safe version in the same way that pr s n printf is the safe version. So, both take the string stored in s2 and copy it to s1. So we are copying, fr copying from the second argument to the first. Notice that this is a constant character array, and this is not a constant character array, which means that this one is the one being modified. String n copy will copy at most n characters, as specified. This guards against buffer overflow, making string n copy the safe version of string copy. Once again, you must make sure, one, s1 is large enough to contain s2, and two, n takes null termination into account. String cat, or string n cat, uh, usage is similar to string copy, but rather than overwriting all of the values in string 1 with string 2's values, you are appending string 2 to string 1. The null terminating character in S1 is overwritten with the first character of S2, and it's, you know... Have you guys heard the term concatenation? Because that's like the technical term for it. So, if you have... Hello, S1 is he hello, and S2 is world. Then S1 concat S2 is equal to hello world. There we go. Is the N for the size of S1 or S2? Hmm. That's a good question, and it doesn't appear on the slides. Let's check the uh, let's check the documentation. Uh, S T R N cat. <laughs> ah, there we go. So according to this website. N is the maximum number of characters to be appended. So that would mean that it is the number of characters you want to append out of S2. Boom. See? When you have a question, just look it up in the documentation. But don't take the internet's advice about which functions to use. STR error. Accepts an error number, finds your computer or compiler's corresponding error message, and returns it. Which is kind of interesting. Um, 
So, and it, you know, when your compiler is spitting out these re messages that are repeated and repeated and repeated, it's because it's looking up an error code and then spitting out the string that it has associated with that er error code, and that is the function that does it. strlen accepts a string and produces the number of characters in it, null character excluded, uh, roughly, uh, roughly equivalent to Python's len function. So, comparison is an operation that exists. Again, we've got safe and unsafe variants of this. Inputs are the same as previously. You can see we're not modifying either of these by uh, the presence of the const um, keyword. Compares the characters in each string sequentially and returns zero if the strings are the same a value less than zero if S1 is less than S2, and a value greater than zero if S1 is greater than S2. In this context, strings are ordered by the ASCII values of their characters using alphabetization rules. This is known as lexicographic ordering. So, for example, if I had A, B, C, D, E, compare A, B, C, D, E, the return result would be zero. If I had AAAB compared AAAC, the result would be negative. If I had AAAD, AAAA, that would be positive, right? And lexicographic ordering, right? So if I had AAA, compare AAAAA, which one comes first? It's this one. So it's less than the other one, so that's a negative re result. And you can embed these right in if statements. <clears throat> so in addition, we have a suite of other functions. strchr locates the first occurrence of character c in string s. If c is found, a pointer to c in s is returned, otherwise null is returned. strc span re uh, determines and returns the length of the initial segment of a the string s1 consisting of characters not contained in string s2. So, you know, how many characters in S1, uh, how many characters can you go into S1 without hitting a character in S2? STR span determines and returns the length of the initial segment of S1 consisting only of characters uh, contained in the string S2. So this one's like excluding S2 characters, this one's including S2 characters. STR p bark locates the uh, first occurrence of the string S1 of any characters uh, in string S2. If a character from S2 is found, a pointer to the character in string S1 is returned, otherwise null. str archer locates the last occurrence of the C and S. str str locates the first occurrence of string 1 and string 2. So that's like you can find a string within a string, right? And then str tok, tokenization. A sequence of calls to tok breaks string s1 into tokens, logical pieces such as words in a line of text, separated by characters contained in the string s2. The first call contains s1 as the first argument, and subsequent calls uh, to continue tokenizing the same string contain null as the first argument. A pointer to the current token is returned each call, if there are no more tokens, when the function is called, null is returned. So there's a reasonably hard assignment problem coming up. Um, I would say the hardest problem in this course, um, where I ask you to take in a new, like a mathematical arithmetic expression and compute it, right? So you're given an expression as a string you have to break it into numbers, break it into operators, and then process it 
according to bed mass rules and then produce the result right that's in an that's that's a problem that's upcoming and str like string token the string tokenization function that's your friend okay in general most of the assignment for stuff can be done like easily if you more easily at least if you know the material in this topic and much more difficult in a, uh, in a much more difficult fashion if you uh, are just trying to use if statements while loops and single character comparisons for everything use the standard library but not always google's recommendations so are there any questions What is tokenization? Oh, it's uh Sure. Okay, let's uh let's actually consider this. Let's consider this phrase, right? This isn't like Tokenization is kind of similar to Python's split operation. Uh it has a somewhat broader meaning, but if you were to take this this line, line number one, and split it into its tokens. The first token would be this one. Next token would be this. Next token would be that. Next token would be that. Next token would be that. Right? So this is, um, this is assuming that tokens are split on spaces. Right? Does that make sense? Tokenization is actually the... Uh, in terms of compiler theory and how compilers are written, tokenization is normally the first step of compilation after pre-processing where a program is broken into like variables and operators and you know literals and keywords Ev like everything is separated out into separate strings so that you can then arrange them into what's called an abstract syntax tree and interpret those tokens in terms of their um you know their semantic contents. Well, you actually, you have to interpret the semantic content in order to construct the abstract syntax tree, but it is what it is. Can you split it something other than space? Yes. So, if you recall, S1 is the string that you're splitting. S2 is all of those characters which you're splitting, which constitute the split character, like, S2 contains all the split characters, right? So, so if you wanted, for example, oh, I don't know, if you wanted to extract just the numbers from a series of, you know, if you wanted to extract just the numbers from some string that contains a series of numbers and mathematical operators and possibly also spaces, you know, like 8 plus 9 plus 0 minus 1, for example, put some spaces in there, then the n strings, uh, the, uh, the things you would be splitting on are space plus, space plus, space plus and minus. Right, and that would tokenize into eight, nine, 
0, and 1. Make sense? That is a huge hint for assignment 4, if you were paying attention. Good. Well, I'm going to log off here. Thank you very much for your time and attention, folks. And uh, happy studying.